the Gospel according to Matthew, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said to the twelve, A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher, and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear for them. For nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetop. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body and hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. I ask you to hang with me this morning. My sermon skips around a little bit. It's almost as confusing as Jesus' teaching in the Gospel lesson. Created for community. If you grab a hold of your bulletin, the blue bulletin, and see that subtitle on there, it says Created for Community. You have, may have noticed this on the bulletin cover subtitle since Pentecost. On the Feast of Holy Trinity, there was one change in that. Our theme was, and God saw that it was good. Remember that little cadence that we did. And God saw that it was good. He created this on the first day, and God saw that it was good. He created this on the second day, and God saw that it was good. Those were borrowed from those repeated phrases in the first creation story in Genesis chapter 1. Did you hear me say the first creation story? We're going to have a little bit of biblical scholarship lesson here. In that first creation account in Genesis 1, God creates humankind in God's image, correct? Genesis chapter 1 is the priestly account of creation. You can always tell what portions of the Hebrew scriptures are from the priestly redaction. Those writers that came and took and wrote over the Yahweh version of the Bible. The priestly redaction occurred after Babylon. They feature Seth, something very distinctive, Set of number. If you ever are going through the Old Testament and you see a three or a seven or sometimes even a four or a forty, three and seven particularly, you realize that that comes from the priestly redaction. The second chapter of Genesis provides another version of the creation story, the Yahweh version. If you speed read through Genesis, you might miss this. It's a shorter version. You don't have a day-by-day -day account.
account, and then God saw that it was good, and then God saw that it was good. God creates humankind in Genesis 2 for humanity to be good stewards over all creation. Now, one more little piece about biblical scholarship before we move on to the gospel lesson today. Noah and the flood. If you look at Genesis 6 through 9, Genesis 6 through 9, you will see two versions of a story, the Yahweh's version and the priestly version. And it's a harder one to catch because they are intertwined. It's one verse after another. There's the main Yahweh's story being told, but every once in a while you see a priestly flag come up and yes, I know you're going to know what this is. It's a number, right? So you'll see the number seven. You always hear the story in Sunday school about all those twos. The two elephants went into the ark. The two giraffes went into the ark. The two snakes slithered, ooh, slithered their way up into the ark. Seven. All of a sudden there's seven put in there. Seven clean animals go into the ark. That is the priestly version. Good, I'll find the elephant. You can get a certificate for the court. <laughs> Let's go back to God creating this community. Let's talk about creating for community of fellow plant, planet dwellers. At the end of the second Genesis account of creation, after God had declared that all is good, all is good, we read this, it's not good. Genesis chapter 2, all of a sudden you hear God say, it's not good. It's not good that humanity should be alone. We are created for community. God is social. That's why God broke every possible barrier that had ever been created in order for Emmanuel God is with us to be with us. God desires to walk with us. The theme of this year's Lower Susquehanna Synod Assembly was, you can get this, created for community. I stole that slogan. And we will use this for the rest of the summer in this season after Pentecost. Indeed, God did create, did create this world to live in community. The basic idea behind shalom, we use the word shalom a lot. And most of the time you probably think of shalom and you, you greet somebody with a peaceful greeting. Shalom. You know they're not going to hit you if they say shalom, right? It is a peaceful greeting. But the basic, the basic idea behind shalom is that things are not just peaceful, it's not just a the Wagner group heading on up to Belarus, right? It's not just a like temporary ceasefire. It is the way that God would have things to be. Shalom equals the way that God would have things to be. That's perfect peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Beyond this moment in Genesis, the creation moment, the rest of the ancient scriptures tell the story of how God seeks to be in relationship with humanity, how God calls humanity to live in God's love. God calls us into community. The commandments are structured in a way, and you've heard me say this before, that you love the Lord your God first. Those are the first couple commandments. <clears throat> then all of the other <clears throat> commandments <clears throat> are about loving your neighbor. Don't tell lies about your neighbor. Don't steal from your neighbor. Don't commit adultery. The list goes on. You are to love the Lord your God with all of your essence of your being, and you are to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said those words. At the Pride Festival, I think I mentioned this last week, I stood at the table, and my job was to give away those bags, those tiny blue bags that say, love your, thou shalt love your neighbor as, as yourself. Thank you. I've got that printed right here, too. 
As each person would walk up, I would offer them a bag. Do you know who your neighbor is? I would ask. And some people looked at me like, well, maybe when I knocked on that door when they were making too much noise, I might have learned their name. And then I would say, everyone is your neighbor. Love everyone. And they get a big smile on their face. Today's gospel scripture. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. A sword. Jesus just ruined our sermon moment. Where is the whole idea about shalom? Where is this Jesus is going to heal the whole world? Where is this Messiah Jesus, the master of the sky and sea who can calm a storm with a spoken word? Peace be still. Yes, Jesus is here to do all of that, but kingdom structure, kingdom structures in response in this world are going to come out fighting. As a reminder of last week's Matthew 9 text, Jesus is preparing his disciples for what types of reactions they're going to encounter as they move from village to village with barely the shirt on their back. There will be loving reception, and then there will be absolutely no reception. And then, yes, there are going to be people who come out fighting. The kingdom of God is an upside-down kingdom compared to humanity's fallen ways. The first are last, and the last are first. When Jesus wants to send representatives of the kingdom out, or model what the kingdom of God looks like, they don't go through the usual vetting that corporate sponsors or media models or any other organizational reps go through. It is an upside-down kingdom. Most often, Jesus sends out people who look just the opposite of the norm. I get a big chuckle. I got my uh, alma mater catalog in the mail yesterday, and I got what the latest students look like at the university. <laughs> and you know, it's just some model that comes out of, uh, comes out of uh, 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 New York City, Madison Avenue or something. If you ever work for an organization and you get a little pamphlet about who, who your organization represents, and there's all these shiny people on the front, and they're always younger than you are, aren't they? Always, always. It just cracks me up. That used to happen to us at the seminary. Half of us, half of our class were second career people. But every time the seminary put out a pamphlet about who was going to seminary, it was a 21-year-old. And they had perfect teeth, and they had perfect hair. And I'll quit my rant now. <laughs> Seriously, though, who is it that Jesus says, this is the kingdom of God? I think a couple of those were in the sanctuary today. One of them is still in the sanctuary. One's out there riding on a little uh, dragon out there in the fellowship hall. Suffer the children to come to me. Suffer those who it's hard for them to walk. Suffer those who barely made it here to worship today. Suffer those who are watching online. But such is the kingdom of God. Suffer those who have a faith that look like they have it all together, maybe, but they don't have it together inside, right? So that is who Jesus called for the kingdom of God. And you know that message, that opposite of the norm, that's what gets Jesus in trouble with his first century society. Because that society, just like the society today, knows, listen to that word, knows how things are supposed to be. 
God the creator, God the sustainer, God the redeemer, God the alpha and omega, the one who will have the final say. He knows the long He knows how things are supposed to be. Jesus talks about taking up the cross. And we use that phrase very lightly. I like to pause every once in a while and remind us all of what taking up the cross means and what the cross looks like in general. I usually start by describing the cross, the, the thing that we know the most about, maybe the medallion around our neck, maybe the shining symbol that's over there by the organ. But it's an old, rugged cross, and it has human blood dripping from it. Not a very nice thing to talk about. It's definitely not dinner time conversation to talk about a dripping cross. The cross is not anything that a first century person would even come up in conversation. Jesus taught in the gospel lesson about, about relationships, about mother and daughter and son and father, and how those relationships will be broken when he comes. It's because those conversations when you're sitting around at the family reunion it's not polite conversation to talk about the cross, especially in first century ancient Near East. Not only would you be talking about a place of capital punishment, like a death row injection table. How many of us sit around and talk about that table that you see pictures of occasionally? that people on death row have to be strapped to and injected with lethal dosages. Not only that, you'd be talking about government insurrection. That would be what would get you in trouble the most. The Romans would execute common troublemakers and leave them along the roads to a village as an example of what could happen to the next troublemaker. But they would also make examples of people who were a threat to Roman rule. Roman rule. The people who knew what was supposed to be, right? Anyone who was a threat to peace, as the Romans knew it. Jesus was definitely a threat. The Prince of Peace was a threat to peace. And these disciples whom he is calling, this is an eye-opener for me. <clears throat> these disciples that he is calling from their current vocations, they're fishing, and they're tax collecting, and their life with their families, he's asking them to carry a cross. He's asking them to carry a message that will upset the apple cart. The good news that Jesus Christ turns tables, but it sets the world free. In the name of Jesus Christ, this is the good news of the kingdom of God. Shalom, the way God would have things to be. We are created for community. In that kingdom of God community, we listen for instructions from the one who is, who was, and who is to come. Romans, Norm read for us the passage from Romans that tells a familiar Christian baptismal story of how we are crucified with Christ. We are co-crucified. We are co-buried with Christ in our baptism, and we are raised with Christ. Jesus calls us to carry and live out this often insurrectional message in the world, and he's not leading down a path of destruction. It's a path of death, yes, death to ourselves, and having to always have our own way. Why? Because we know 
the way. It's a pathway that's going to get us into some trouble along the way because it's countercultural, but it's a pathway of community building, community of Christ building. The very foundation of the body of Christ is built upon humility and death and life, resurrection life. The only way we have life <clears throat> is in Christ Jesus, who we are completely tied to in this co-crucifixion thing. Isn't it interesting that the one who blew the breath of life into us in Genesis and created us for community in Genesis 1 and 2 is the one who continues to blow new life into us and calls us to breathe new life into the community. Don't bother.